it's white to play in this position. Please check whether bishop takes f5 is a good move or a blunder. Now, I'm not a quantum physicist, so take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. But I have some intuition about a thought experiment called Schrodinger's cat. In quantum mechanics, Schrodinger's cat is a thought experiment that illustrates the paradox of superposition. Imagine a cat. He's sealed inside the sealed box, and there's a mechanism inside the box that has 50% chance of killing the cat. Now, until we open the box and see the cat's status, we have to accept that the cat is both alive and dead. That's the paradox of superposition. We have to imagine, until we open the box and see the cat, that the cat is both living and dead. That's the original paradox when it comes to Schrodinger's cat. So what's the lesson? A state of uncertainty exists until the box is open and outcome is observed. What am I talking about? Why am I talking about the cat, Schrodinger's cat in a chess video, guys? Well, I will make a maybe a far-fetched analogy, but I think there's some point to it. In chess, a move can be considered both good and bad until fully calculated. As in this example, folks, bishop takes f5 is both a good move and a bad move until you come to a clear conclusion by carefully going through a blunder check process. Please blunder check the move bishop takes f5, folks. What are you seeing? We keep talking about loose pieces in chess. By taking on f5 with the bishop, you're creating a loose bishop on that square, right? Because that will be attacked once and guarded only once by your rook. Loose pieces have an equal number of attackers and defenders in chess. Thus, the move might be a blunder. You must be extra careful. Plus, by taking on f5, folks, can you see? You're creating an alignment on the open f file. You're creating an open file and you're creating an alignment between your pieces. Plus, you even create a loose rook on f1. The bishop was protecting the rook. The moment you take on f5, folks, the rook itself is becoming a loose piece. So, as Dan Heisman says, the seeds of tactical destruction may have been planted in the white's camp the moment you take on f5. But we refuse to come to a clear conclusion until we fully calculate a line. What move you must calculate for black? What's the most challenging move that can potentially refute your idea of bishop takes f5, folks? What's the most testing move that might kill the cat using Schrodinger's terminology here? Yes, folks, it's rook f8. Rook f8 seems to be the move that directly exploits the loose bishop on f5, the loose rook on f1, and even the alignment you just created, okay? So, you must calculate that move. Bishop takes f5, rook f8. Is the cat alive or dead? After rook f8, you have to go three plies deeper to conclude whether the cat is alive or dead. You tell me. Yes, folks, there's a way to move the bishop to d3 and to guard the rook on f1 and offering a rook trade in the process and you gobbled up a pawn for nothing. Are you with me, folks? Are you following my chain of thinking? Please visualize. Bishop takes f5, rook f8, bishop d3, exclaim, takes, takes, white won a pawn with a clearly winning bishop endgame. Let's put it on the board, folks. Bishop takes f5, exclaim, Rook f8 must be seen by white to properly calculate this move, and then you find the move bishop d3. That's the only move to yeah, safeguard your loose bishop on f5 while also guarding the rook on f1. The rook is no longer hanging. The rook is protected by the bishop. You offer a trade, and this position is completely won for white with an extra pawn. And the king is coming like this all the way to f4. This pawn is also weak. This bishop and game is completely lost for black. So what is the analogy to quantum mechanics, folks? Well, until you fully calculated that line I showed you, bishop takes f5 should be considered both a good move and a blunder at the same time. It looks good. I'm winning a pawn. Beautiful looking move. But it might also be a blunder because rook f8 is coming to potentially exploit 
the loose pieces and the alignment you just created, right? So to be able to open the box properly and see the health status of the cat, you have to go three plies deeper in this case. The reason I talk about Schrodinger's cat and science for this blunder check process is very simple, folks. To me, blunder check process resembles the scientific approach the most, right? You see counter evidence from the world, just like a scientist before you calculate this move and properly blunder check your move. What does this mean, blunder check? You're trying to falsify your ideas. You're searching for the best move for the opponent. You're aware of the potential drawbacks of your very move, just like scientific approach. Scientists don't seek for confirming evidence from the world. They seek counter evidence from the world before accepting a hypothesis, right? Just like in science, just because a move looks good, you can't play it impulsively. Then you're opening yourself for disasters and blunders. One more example, folks, from my blunder check course. Should black play bishop d3 or bishop b3 in this position? Please observe the situation. It's black to play. There is one move that wins for black. The other one is a terrible blunder. But even the terrible blunder looks like a beautiful move at first sight. Okay? Please go through the process, folks. Can you see? The rook on c1 is a loose piece. The bishop on c2 can become a pinned piece on the next turn. We, our goal as black is to exploit the loose rook on c1 and the alignment on the c-file. That's our tactical goal from this position. But one approach is a game-losing blunder. The other one is winning this game, folks. You tell me. Well, you're a great player, folks. If you want to move bishop d3 in this position, very simple. You don't give a check to white. There is no way for the white bishop to move and give a check to exploit the loose rook on c8 and you win the game on the next turn. If they take the bishop, they have an extra exchange with a winning position. Can you see? Bishop b3 also looks identical. Looks like the same idea. I want to win an exchange and win the game. At first sight, it looks like a beautiful move, right? But you have to tell me whether the cat is alive or dead after the move bishop b3. We have to consider this move as both good and bad using Schrodinger's analogy until we properly calculate the best response for the opponent. Okay? The biggest difference, folks, is you're allowing bishop h7 check and they're exploiting the loose rook on c8 in this position. And it's white who has the extra exchange with a winning position. So, the cat is living after bishop d3, but the cat is dead after bishop b3. It's also so beautiful, right? Like if you, go to, if you go to Puzzle Rush, you keep finding puzzles like this that always work for you, right? You're training the concept of, of a pin in those tactical puzzle books that always work for your side. You don't actively search for counter evidence from the world before engaging in those puzzles. So you, of course, you see a good idea like this. Yay, Bishop B3, I'm winning, pinning and winning, yay! And then blunders happen in the process. So, what's the biggest conclusion from this? Prove yourself wrong. Don't prove yourself right. One more beautiful position, folks. It's white to play in this position. White has great concentration of the pieces on the king side. And now, first of all, I will let you, okay? First of all, I will let you to take a moment in this position and find a winning idea for white, okay? The prompt is this, of course. We have beautiful pieces on the king side, concentrated on the king side. Our black has several pieces in Siberia. Okay, so our goal obviously is to use our superiority on the king side to find a good idea that directly wins something on the king side. All right, assuming you spend some time in this position, folks, I will give you the first prompt that will make it easier for you to spot the winning idea. Have you seen the knight fork potential in this position, folks? This f6 square is the key square that if a knight lands on f6, then the game is instantly finished. So our goal might be to, let's say, remove the pawn on g7, force it to move potentially, or even maybe to capture it directly into moves using this tactical alignment between our knight and the queen and the king. Okay? So the winning idea involves you disturbing that pawn and allowing knight f6 ideas. Please take a stock and generate several candid moves that speaks to this idea. Folks, 
once I give you this prompt, I think these two ideas come to your mind, right? Just like in Schrodinger's cat, we have a fork. One might let the cat survive, the other move might kill the cat. All right? So it's now your turn to decide which one is a winning idea and which one is a terrible blunder. All right? Bishop f6 or bishop h6. Spotting an idea is one thing. Blunder check is an independent and the final step that we always need to conclude our ideas with. Chess calculation always ends with this proof stage, blunder check stage. All right? Right? Bishop f6 or bishop h6. Folks, you're a great player if you found the move bishop h6. That's the move that directly wins for white in this position. The idea is simply to put pressure on the g7 pawn. Right now, there are two attackers on that pawn, and there's only a single queen that is defending. What's the point? If they grab the bishop, comes knight f6 check. And this game is completely finished. We take the queen and go for a mating attack very, very soon. Okay? So after bishop h6, the bishop cannot be captured. Can black go knight e8 to guard g7, folks? Please, very quick tactical vision. No, because knight e8 unprotects the f8 square and allows queen f8 mate. Please see this position, folks. Beautiful. Otherwise, I will take on g7, follow it up with knight f6, right? For example, any other move like knight c4, I can simply take on g7 with the bishop, introducing those ideas, not to mention those ideas, and black cannot survive in this position. Works. Why just wins directly in this position? Okay? So, then, put it this way. What was wrong with the move bishop f6? Bishop f6 seems identical at first sight, right? The same idea after bishop f6. If you take my bishop, there is still a knight fork winning the game. So it looks identical. But I want you to become like Schrodinger. I want you to become a scientist here. Guys, please seek for counter evidence from the world that can potentially refute the move bishop f6. The cat is indeed dead after bishop f6, folks. Not that you allow takes, but you allow rook f8. Please visualize. Bishop f6 creates the alignment on the f-file. Bishop f6 gives the f8 square for the rook on a8, folks. You're closing down the f-file voluntarily and allowing rook f8, which exploits directly the alignment you just created on the f-file. By placing your bishop on f6, you create an alignment between the white pieces, between the queen and the bishop, and invite the move rook f8. Suddenly, it's black, who is slightly better in this position, folks. They also take away those ideas because the queen will be captured. If knight takes on g7, comes queen takes g7, and this line is actually working for black because of two extra pieces for the rook. The best move for white is probably queen g3 to pin that pawn. But here black can even go g6, folks. And you can no longer take on g7 with those knight f6 ideas. And if bishop e5 in this position, that they can trade the rooks and play knight e8 to stop knight f6 checks. Indeed, it's black who is slightly better in this position with an extra pawn. And white's attack is not in decisive proportions. Again, look at the big picture. You found the winning idea. The winning idea involves attacking the pawn that is stopping not f6 forks, but the execution is everything. There are two different ways that seems to be achieving your goal. One of them is a game-winning move. There is no counterplay, nothing. You keep the f-file open as well. There is no knight e8, there is no rook f8. The game is totally gone. But the other move kills the cat because you don't try to falsify your idea. You don't ask yourself, What's the drawback of my own move? How can they punish me? Am I giving a resource to black that wasn't here before? Did you properly check for all the drawbacks behind the move bishop f6? So, bishop f6 should be considered both a great move and a terrible blunder until you properly check for blunder, until you properly calculate a line that tries to refute this move. This will force you to act like Erving Schrodinger. This will be your homework position, folks. If you'd like to play in this position, please take a stock and find the best continuation for black. What's the best idea for black in this position? Take a stock. I will give you the first prompt. White has the extra bishop in this position, right? They have an extra bishop, but I'm sure this clumsy rook on f4 catched your eye in this position. All right? 
That rook is very clumsy on f4. Maybe black can win something in this position. Put it this way. Do you want to go e5 in this position? Or do you want to do something else, right? e5 looks like a beautiful winning move. Hit the rook, trap the rook, and win the game. It looks like a beautiful resource indeed. But does it really, really work? We have to consider that move both as winning and losing until you to properly calculate a good response for the opponent. And if you think e5 is a blunder, please tell me what should black play instead, right? Write to me on YouTube, write your comments, ideas, and why that idea works for you. Chess breeds prudence, self-control, guys, don't you think? Just because an idea looks beautiful, we should not impossibly play it. We should become a scientist, seek for counter evidence from the world before accepting our hypothesis. That's the process that resembles the science most, and that's exactly why I created my course Preventing Blunders in Chess. That will train this ability of spotting good resources, but very importantly, going through a very scientific blunder check process by actively searching for the best reply for the opponents. Many beginners never do that. They never check for the opponent's resources. They don't play chess for both colors, which you must. At any point, you should try to seek for the best move both for white and black. Many players only focus on their own ideas, right? Wishful thinking, confirmation bias, looks good, let's play it and see what happens, kind of bad habit mentality. And that will change after this specific training on the blunder check process. And this needs deliberate practice, this needs challenging task on a crucial skill as the blunder check to reframe our mind, changing our mental models and eradicating those bad habits. Cats are lovely creatures. Don't kill your cats, please. See you.